6. A Storm of Leaves Marty remembered closing his eyes tightly as the crawler skidded and fell. He had no recollection of opening them again, but he realised he could see light. There had been the smack of impact which had thrown him hard against the bunk curtain, but a dragging, breaking impact followed by a second, sharp and final, but not the annihilating crash which he had expected, which had seemed inevitable. Not only light but colour, it shimmered softly through the spectrum, reds and golds, greens and blues, a dream. He closed his eyes and opened them again. The colours were still there, and outside. He was seeing them through the observation dome of the crawler, and yet impossible. He looked for Steve and saw him slumped against the wall. He went to him, having to climb up because the crawler was at an angle, its nose pointing down. He said, Steve, and touched his hand. It seemed warm, but there was no response. Things were moving, high in the rainbow air. He looked up and saw them, and it was more fantastic than colours. They were like leaves, a storm of them. But leaves that floated upwards, leaves, he thought. Floating? Was he dead, perhaps? Was this the afterworld? Heaven? Dazed, he went to the airlock. It crossed his mind that he ought to put a suit on, but a spacesuit to walk through paradise? He buttoned the inner door, stepped inside, and released the outer. He had not operated the air pump, but there was no hiss of escaping air. Instead, air billowed in against him, pleasantly warm. It felt thick, heavy rich to the lungs and sweet to the nostrils. He jumped down, and his feet sank into springy softness. His eyes were growing accustomed to the light. It was altogether unlike anything he had known. Light on the moon was full of harshness, hard blacks and whites with intermediate somber greys. This was gentle, flickering, continually changing, richly coloured, he glanced down and saw that there was light at his feet, too. He stood on a carpet of something like moss, and the carpet glowed green, mauve, dull amber. He walked and saw tiny stars of light splash from his treading feet. Splash? He bent down and touched with his fingers. Wetness clung to them. He had read of dew in meadows on earth, small beads of brilliance hanging poised on spears of grass. Dew? On the barren moon? If he were not dead, he must be dreaming. He could take in his surroundings better now. He was inside a cavern some fifteen metres across, and perhaps half that height. It was roughly circular, but the floor sloped down. At the bottom it dipped quite sharply and there was what looked like the opening of a tunnel. The leaves. He raised his eyes looking for them. A few still moved through the air but most seemed to have plastered themselves against the ceiling in a glowing patchwork. Light came from them as it did from moss. Phosphorescence, that was it. By the far wall there was a moss-encrusted outcropping of rock. Further up in the middle of the cave, he saw what at first sight looked like a giant snake. Giant indeed, more than a foot in thickness and lying in a huge, elaborate coil. The body of it was black, but the top swelled into a spheroid, creamy white, a couple of meters in diameter. Not a snake, he realized. The other end disappeared into the ground. And yet, that did not mean anything. In dreams, nothing was fixed, everything capable of changing into something else. He watched to see if it would move. Nothing happened. Then he jumped as something slightly touched his cheek. 
He brushed at it frantically with his hand and saw a leaf go spinning away through the air, deepening from pink to crimson as it went. Two or three others were spiralling down toward him. He turned back to the crawler, jumped into the airlock and closed the door behind him. He heard a noise as he came through the inner door. From Steve, a small groan. Uh. Marty bent down and saw movement. He lifted Steve's head and the eyes opened. You okay? He asked. I thought you were dead. What happened? Steve winced, momentarily closing his eyes again. We hit that loose rock. It's not a dream then. He felt almost disappointed. People don't share dreams. Dreams? Where are we? Steve struggled to his feet. That light, is it real? I don't know. It must be. What's that? Three of the leaves floated down and rested on top of the crawler. Two were pale lemon, the other a deep, pulsating blue. After a moment, the lemon-coloured ones detached themselves and drifted up and away, but the third remained. What? What is it? Steve insisted. Marty started to tell him as much as he knew. Steve interrupted to say, You went outside? In a suit? No. It seems silly to say you did not need a spacesuit when you were dead. I was a bit dazed. But you could breathe? Yes. There's air all right. It's, it's different, scented, and it seems to make your lungs tingle, but you can breathe it. I was about five minutes out there. I don't believe it. Nor did I at first. We're in some sort of cave. It was beginning in a weird way to make sense. Since they were obviously alive, it had to. I suppose we're inside the moon. We must have broken through the surface in that fall. Steve shook his head and then put a hand up to it, grimacing. I must have landed on my skull, he paused. I'm going out to have a look. How far did you explore? Not far. He was not going to say that a leaf had scared him. Come on then. Steve stopped by the airlock. You're sure you went out? You didn't imagine it? Marty rubbed his fingers together. They were still wet. No, I didn't imagine it. They stood in silence, the pattern of colours moved and spun along the walls and ceiling and floor of the cave. Steve spoke at last. He said, Well, where? He had not spoken loudly, but his voice had a slightly echoing quality. Marty said, keeping his own hushed. What do you mean? You said we'd broken through to the inside of the moon. How? Where's the hole we made? It was a good point. All round, above them, the colours ebbed and flowed in lumbency. There did not appear to be a space a grip spike could penetrate, let alone something as big as the crawler. Well, we're here, Marty said, and I remembered crashing. There were two impacts, the first a sort of dragging one. The second must have been when we dropped this last bit to the floor. He remembered something else. The leaves which had been rushing through the air and which he had later seen plastered against the ceiling. He looked for them again and could not find them. That part of the cave's roof was no different from the rest. No leaf shape showing in its kaleidoscope of shifting patterns. He told Steve of this. Steve said, Does that explain anything? I suppose it could. He stared round. There has to be an explanation, doesn't there? I mean, it can't be Jabberwocky. It must have rules. We've only got to think them out. Marty said, I wonder. What? 
There's air in here a bit denser than in the bubble, I would say. The cave has to be sealed or it would simply rush out into the vacuum. The leaves floating up may have plugged the gap that was made when the crawler crashed through. Steve objected. It's not possible. How do you make a vacuum seal with leaves? And where are they now? I don't know. But we're here, we're alive, and we must have got in some way, Steve said. It's crazy. Let's look around. We may find something. They went up the sloping floor. The moss covered it completely. It was an inch or two deep, and one could push one's fingers through to soil underneath. Reaching the wall, they could see there was no dividing line. The moss climbed up without a break. Looking back, they saw that the floor carried the same shimmering play of colours as walls and ceiling, except that where they had walked, the imprints of their feet showed darker. But these gradually blended back into the colours and were lost. Steve pressed his hand against the wall at shoulder height. There can't be soil on a vertical surface. I thought not, so how? Wait a minute. Thin stalks running up. But what kind of plant could work that way? What kind of leaves float upwards? Well, if there were a hole in the roof and air was blowing out, I suppose the current would draw them up. Except we still have the same nonsense of leaves sealing a gap between quite high air pressure and absolute vacuum. And where do the leaves come from? I don't see any trees around. There's that. Marty pointed to the black snake-like coils topped by the vast bud. Not leaves, though. Steve went over and Marty followed him. They ran their hands along it. The surface was very smooth and hard. The spheroid end was raised above the rest, some ten feet high. Steve jumped to try to touch it, but failed. It moved a bit, Marty said. I didn't see. How? A sort of swaying. It was hard to describe. He felt uneasy. It had almost looked as though the movement had been a conscious one. But that was ridiculous. He said, you, you probably shook it. No leaves anyway, Steve said. And no sign of anywhere there could have been. There isn't a break on the whole of that surface. I'm going to take a closer look at that leaf which landed on the crawler. But when they reached the crawler, there was no sign of it. Steve stared around the cave. They have to come from somewhere and go somewhere. What's that down there at the bottom? It looks like a small tunnel. Steve clicked his fingers. It was something which he did well and which Marty, despite hours of trying, could not do at all. That's it, he said. Of course, a tunnel. With an air current blowing through. Blowing which way? Marty asked. The leaves came and now they seem to have gone. And I can't feel a breeze. Can you? The air was still and heavy and scented. Marty tried to think what the scent was like, but he had very little experience to go by. The bubble was almost odourless, a place where the nose had very limited scope. This scent was not cloying, but light and subtly shifting, like the colours. The ground dipped sharply and they could see the tunnel. It went down at an angle of almost 45 degrees. It was quite wide and had plenty of headroom, but for the slope it would have been easy to walk down. Maybe an intermittently varying airflow, Steve said. Caused by what? Steve stared into the tunnel. I don't know. But the answer is down there. It has to be. There's nowhere else the leaves could have come from, or gone to. Uneasily, Marty said. I suppose you're right. So, the obvious thing is to go and look. You don't know what's there. Leaves, I hope. And trees as well, I should think. 
Maybe moonbirds nesting in them. What I meant was, there could be a precipice or something. You won't get much purchase on the moss, on a slope like that, if you slip. I won't. One could see a few yards into the tunnel, after which it twisted to the left. There was no way of knowing what lay past the bend. Steve said, No point in our both going down. You hang on up here. Marty was not sure whether Steve had read the reluctance in his voice. He said angrily, I'm going down if you are, I just thought... I've got a better idea, said Steve. Get a rope from the crawler. One goes down and one stays as anchor man. My idea, so I have the choice. Fair enough? It was obviously sensible. Marty went back to the crawler and fetched a coil of rope. Steve fastened it round his waist, pulling hard to check the knot. We're off then. Take a strain. He sat down and slid feet first into the tunnel. His body left a trail of phosphorence on the moss. Marty stood with his feet apart and paid out rope. He saw Steve reach the bend and go round it. The rope came hard over against the wall on that side, cutting into the moss and disappearing beneath the shimmer. Marty hoped there wasn't a sharp edge under there. Steve's voice came back echoing, All right from here. You sure? Yes. The tunnel levels. I can walk. I'll keep paying out. Right. Marty stared about him as he lay the rope through his hands. Against the pervasive glimmer, the squat hulk of the crawler looked hard and yet unreal. Their refuge, he supposed. There was food for a few weeks. After that, he thought of being alone here with the spheroid that shook on its vast black trunk, the leaves that came and went like ghosts or messengers. How long since Steve had gone? Thirty seconds? A minute? Five minutes? He had no idea. He looked at his finger watch and saw that it was 1.30. 1.30 a.m. That would be... Earth time. Bubble time. Time meant nothing in this glowing cave. Could it have been more than five minutes? The rope was no longer under tension, but lying slack. Did that just mean that Steve had stopped going forward, or... Steve's voice came up, muffled and very distant. So thin he could only just make out the words. Marty, come down. Where are you? It's all right. Come and see. It's fantastic. He was still not keen on facing the tunnel, but delaying would not help. He made the rope secure by knotting the end round one of the crawler tracks. Then he flung himself down the slope, sliding. The moss here was not actually wet, but damp and very springy. He got round the bend and found, as Steve had said, that the floor turned into an easy, downward incline. The tunnel was very big. It would have taken the crawler with room to spare. He walked along towards another bend, to the right this time, and saw as he approached it that there was brighter light beyond. When he turned the corner... He saw Steve sitting, silhouetted against it. As Marty reached him, he said, Look, it's unbelievable. The tunnel emerged on a ledge. They were near the top of a second cave, much bigger than the first, and there was an arch at the far end which provided a glimpse of a third. This cave was well over a hundred feet across, and they were perched at the top of a 60 or 70 degrees slope, at least 50 feet above the floor. Walls and ceiling were covered with moss, but here it glowed with a steadier, whiter light down below. Marty supposed you could call them trees, though they resembled no tree he had ever seen in books or on television. A tangle of trunks and stems and branches ending in a riot of leaves of different shapes and colours. 
all brilliant, and all in motion. The trunk swayed, branches lifted and tossed, leaves shook as though in a gale. Yet up here the air was still. Perhaps not down there. He saw, though, that the movements were not uniform, not in any one direction. Two of the larger trees, as he watched, leaned in towards each other, their branches touching and mingling, and leaves from both detached themselves, lifting, fluttering into the air, danced and spun in a wide fanning movement before settling down again. He said, The leaves, they went back onto the branches. Steve said, I know, watch that. He pointed towards the far side of the cave, where there were no trees, but a fuzzy greenish-purple stuff covered the ground. Part swelled up from the rest, became a prominence and then a ball that rose and hovered, bobbing, a dozen feet in the air. Others appeared and behaved in similar ways. After a few minutes, it was possible to count five of them, dancing as the leaves had done, over and under and round each other, faster and faster until they seemed to blur into one. What are they? I don't know. Look, they're changing. The balls had ceased to spin and were sinking back towards the ground. One of them, though, did not. Instead, it changed shape, becoming what looked like a pair of wings with no connecting body. The wings beat and soared up until it was almost on a level with the ledge. Automatically, Marty drew back, but it did not approach them. It flapped its way several times round the cave, then swooped down to the spot from which it had come. Purple-green ran into purple-green. There was a lump, a dissolving mound, finally the same flat surface there had been in the beginning. They watched, fascinated but uncomprehending, for a long time. There was always something happening, some movement or eruption, brilliant and meaningless. And Steve said he was hungry. You could try eating the moss, Marty suggested. Mm, I don't fancy it. It's probably poisonous anyway. Let's go back to the crawler and get some food. We can come here again afterwards. He led the way up the tunnel, reeling in the rope. When they reached the bottom of the slope, Marty said, Better not take a strain on it unless you have to. I tied it to the crawler. We don't know how firmly anchored it is. We might pull it down on us. Good point. We should be able to jump it fairly easily. He did not make it the first time, but Marty did. He stood at the top and gave Steve a hand to get up. The crawler was in the same place, but something else was different. There was no snake-like coil. The black trunk ran straight up from floor to ceiling, where the glowing moss closed tightly round it. So the spheroid must be outside. Marty pointed to it. Do you know what I think? Steve said it for him. Thurgood's flower. It was in bud before. Now it's up there somewhere. Probably opened out. But what for? Marty asked. To attract interplanetary bees? It's probably not a flower, really. It could be absorbing sunlight. Plants live on solar energy. A chlorophyll conversion or something similar. I wonder. Could this all be part of one organism? One plant? And yet they're all separate. The leaves, the fuzzballs, the bird thing. Marty was looking past the black column at the moss-covered outcropping of rock he had noticed the first time he emerged from the crawler. He saw now how regular in shape it was, and that it did not actually join onto the wall. On the moon's surface, rocks sometimes had shapes that from a distance, in a certain light, could look artificial. It was probably no more than that, but he felt a new prickle of uneasiness. Thurgood's flower, which 70 years ago he had lost his life searching for. 
He walked across the cave and Steve followed him. The shape was more regular as they drew near, not less. A shape that beneath the blurring mask of moss was familiar. Standing by one corner, Marty reached down and pulled out a tuft. Light gleamed on metal, a section of crawler track. They stared in silence for a few moments. Steve said at last, So he found it, after all. He must have fallen through, the way we did. And then? Light gleamed on metal. A section of crawler track. Steve said slowly, I suppose he's still inside. We were very lucky not to break our necks. Flesh did not decay in the lifeless vacuum of the surface. But there was air here and life. A skeleton hunched over the controls. The only skeleton the moon had ever known. Marty turned away, feeling sick and frightened, because if Thurgood had not died in the crash, then he had died later, more slowly and agonizingly, when his food gave out. They might be envying him yet, as they went back to their crawler, he said. Do you think we ought to ration ourselves on supplies? Steve said gloomily. I suppose so. Not that it's going to make much difference. It isn't as though anyone is likely to come looking for us. Even if the radio is still working, we can't transmit through rocks. They went into the crawler. The air felt musty and thin after the thick, sweet-smelling air of the cave. Marty kept his eyes away from the mossy wreck but he was very much aware of it. He could not help wondering how long it would be before their own crawler looked like that.